Okay. Um, I've left out far more than I'm able to put in, and in 20 minutes I certainly can't do justice to biomechanics, and I'm completely in agreement that if you understand the anatomy and the biomechanics, you understand everything that needs to be known about the assessment and treatment at the shoulder. So deliberately what I've tried to do today, because we're at the start of this, uh, this couple of days, is to pick some things which might provoke discussion. For discussion, you can read arguments. So here's what I want to talk about, which I think I want to try and be able to get across to you that we understand now, and hopefully you'll disagree with all three of these. And I want to point to some areas where I think we still need some work to go. So firstly, let's talk a little bit about the throwing shoulder. And the pathology that we commonly see in the throwing shoulder is an undersurface posterior superior cuff tear associated with a slap lesion, a type 2 slap lesion, originally described probably independently by Burkhart Morgan and Kibler's group uh, as associated with a posterior superior infolding of the cuff and potentially a compressive etiology of the cuff tears there. Independently, I said, uh, Burkhart Morgan and Kibler's group along with Gilles Volch uh, in France. Now, the striking thing about throwing athletes is this remarkable position that their arm gets into. And every single time you throw as hard as you can, if you're good at throwing, your arm goes into this position. And it goes into there largely passively. So what I mean by passively is your arm is placed into that position and then as your trunk whips around into rotation, your arm is left there largely by inertial lag. So the, this underscores the importance of us examining the passive external rotation range of motion in these throwing athletes. And as you'll also see here, it's not in the anatomic plane. The external rotation happens in the scapular plane. Uh, you don't see this unless you're looking at it from above. You start to appreciate that the inertia of the hand, wrist, forearm and the ball, as the body whips forward away from that, the hand's left behind and it's pulled into abduction external rotation. But relative scapular plane, not horizontal abduction. That way lies destruction. Now the first of the controversies that I want to discuss relates to the, I think, commonly widely held misconception, I think, that because throwers get their pain more or less in this position, and this is where more or less we see anterior shoulder instability, that likely what's going on with throwers is anterior instability. And typically this is underscored by the fact that they're seen to have a positive relocation containment sign and therefore this must be anterior instability. I'm also going to talk about the labrum and uh, the role of cuff pathology and all three of these things interweave. So over the next three topics, over the next 10 minutes or so, this is what I want to try and get across. Central to this notion that the throwing shoulder is largely a manifestation of anterior instability is this notion that it's a continuum of micro instability. So some people's head of humerus slips a little bit forwards and other people's heads of humerus slip a lot forwards. If this is the central thing that's going on with the throwing shoulder, then my argument is that throwers, while some of them might not go terribly far forwards, some of them are going to go too far forwards. So the instance, the incidence, I should say, of anterior instability in throwers should be higher than the general public. Let's examine that. In 500 skeletons, Edelson's group found bony evidence of anterior dislocation, evidence of past hill sacs lesions and bony bankart lesions in 24 of them, a tick under 5%. A little over 2,000 people turning up to casualty wards in Sweden. Hevelius found uh, that in the order of 30 odd or just below 2% of those were turning up because of anterior instability. Clearly not everyone who dislocates their shoulder goes on to present at a casualty. But the incidence we can say is perhaps somewhere around here, maybe one in 20. Now the next two categories I want to talk about are two different levels of throwers. Cricketers, as far as I'm concerned, are throwers who are probably better than average people, but they certainly aren't expert throwers. Cricket's a sport played uh, in all of the Commonwealth countries, pretty much. But in, to be a good cricketer, you don't need to be a good thrower. There's no way you would get a job in professional cricket just because you were a good thrower. It's seen as an advantage if you are. You probably need to throw, but you can be a bad thrower and still play cricket. John Orchard's series of 527 injuries over, I think, a couple of years, showed only four anterior instabilities. So in these throwing athletes, albeit not terribly good throwing athletes, the incidence of anterior instability looks to be a little bit lower than the general population. 
I managed to get a hold of the disabled list data for the people I think are the best throwers in the world, Major League Baseball pitchers, and for 2,500 injuries over a 12-year period, there's never been an instance of anterior dislocation. So my argument here is the better the thrower you are, in fact, the lower the incidence of anterior instability. I think this um, pulls the rug out from underneath the notion that what's going on here is largely related to anterior instability. How could that be? Uh, we've already heard Pau talk about this paper by Steve O'Brien's group, published some 30-something, 20-something years ago now, where they originally described the anatomy of the anterior inferior and posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. But as we now also know, these are really just thickenings in the capsule. The really nice thing that O'Brien's group did in that um, landmark paper was show that the anatomy of this doesn't stay static. So as you change the position of the head of the humerus, in this case for internal to external rotation, they described it as a hammock moving underneath the head of the humerus. So the anatomy when your arm's by your side is the anatomy is different, well the anatomy is the same, but the arrangement is different when you get back into this cocking position. So the thought here is that during these extremes of abduction and external rotation, if there's an aberrantly thickened, tightened posterior inferior capsule, then as you abduct externally rotate, this tight thickened capsule is going to lead to a postero superior translation of the head of the humerus. This at one helps describe for us why we see the pathology where we see it, postero superior undersurface cuff tears, why we don't see anterior instability in high level throwers. Now there's, an in, there's a, a really long raft of um, evidence to back this up. Time prevents me from going through all of it, so I'll just present to you one paper which is done uh, in live subjects, where these guys put people in an MR with their arm by their side and in abduction and external rotation, and then in that position tracked both the centre of the humeral head and the position where the humeral head contacts the glenoid. So in their comparison cohort, uh, at rest with the arm by the side, the humeral head was essentially centred. It wasn't anterior, it wasn't posterior, uh, one millimetre, two millimetres and so on. When these people with cuff tears took their arm out into abduction and external rotation, the head of humerus went a little bit backwards, perhaps a mil. Now those with slap tears again started with their arm by their side, pretty much centred on the head of the humerus, but when they went into abduction and external rotation, they went a long way posterior. So it seems that if there is an instability associated with a slap tear, it's not anterior instability in this category of athletes. Central to understanding all of this is getting a handle on uh, the role that the capsule plays and the relative uh, changes that the capsule, that changes in the capsule will induce in the total rotational range of motion. It's now been pretty well understood that it's foolish to just look at, for example, external rotation range or internal rotation range in isolation, you have to look at the sum of the two of these. For any given individual without pathology, this should be the same on both of their shoulders, although every one of you will be different in terms of what that total rotational range will be. Now the trick here is, uh, it's commonly clinically stated that just internal rotation tells you about the posterior capsule and external rotation tells you about the anterior capsule. What I'm trying to get across here is if you are in this axial plane, you can't rotate the capsule and just stretch part of the towel. The whole towel is going to be wrung out, not just the front part or the back part. Okay? But what you can do, and this isn't, I feel so embarrassed even showing this, dis, uh, this dissection after having power been up, but I didn't do it, trust me. <laughs> So we're looking at the, uh, the humerus here, the scapula here, and I'm doing some translation here, but you can see as we wind up into rotation, the entire capsule tightens, but when I come into horizontal adduction, the tension on the anterior capsule's gone. I don't show you on this, but of course the tension on the posterior capsule is markedly enhanced. So rotation plus horizontal AB adduction will tell us things about the anterior or posterior aspects of the capsule, not rotation per se. So if, as we think, uh, repeated eccentric overload probably helps to lengthen the contractile elements, that both the series and passive elastic elements are going to reactively hypertrophy and thicken, which of these two guys do you think is going to be the one who's going to be overloading 
uh, his posterior cuff by going to forced extreme internal rotation in horizontal adduction because he's not dissipating the load at his entire kinetic chain and rather he's doing it just at his shoulder. That's the guy with the sore shoulder. With a couple of, um, with Goran and Tine, who I, I can't see, but I'm sure they're here somewhere. Think now what's going on with this category of athletes. Watch how little their body contributes to the deceleration phase after they've struck the ball. So where is all of that load being dispersed, disseminated? Completely here. And so this is perhaps why we see a different category of pathology in these groups to what we see in other overhead athletes. And understanding the links throughout the kinetic chain really helps to br bring this home. Um, just, uh, I have to talk about this, that the bony adaptation is a significant driver of change in this rotational range of motion, such that it turns out that the amount of twist about the long axis of the humerus, the amount of humeral torsion varies from arm to arm, from subject to subject, such that if this humerus is more backwards twisted like that, you're going to be more like this guy with more external rotation, but at the expense of having lost some internal rotation, but the total rotational range stays the same. So this is retrotorted and that's anti-torted humerus. This is pretty easy to measure. You can use an ultrasound to do it. It turns out that ultrasound measurement of this mercifully for us, because it spares us of the ionising radiation, is uh, more accurate than CT scanning and certainly more accurate than X-ray and it only takes about two minutes. It relies on the fact that the, uh, the long head of the biceps, or more specifically the, gr the adjacent greater and lesser tubicles, at their deepest point, which is also the point where it changes direction, maintains a constant angular relation with the head of the humerus, or rather the, uh, the centre of uh, um, the articular surface of the head of the humerus. So by standardising this, by placing these two at their greatest heights, uppermost, and then measuring the inclination of the arm, we get a, a proxy for the amount of humeral torsion. This varies markedly between subjects such that in the first 200 of these that we measured, you could be anywhere from 12 degrees of external rotation to 62 degrees of internal rotation. So average values in this regard become meaningless. The biggest within subject variance we've seen is 45 degrees, or so a difference like this. Torsional changes change your proprioception, which makes us think this might be more related to muscular receptors, not capsular in these throwing athletes. And it changes your injury, injury incidence. Uh, we looked at 35 adolescent players for 30 months and found that it was the side-to-side -side torsional difference which predicted injury. In a much better paper, Mark Schickendance's group at Cleveland Indians followed 25 Major League Baseball players and found for every extra degree of retro torsion, you had a one in nine reduction in the amount of um, uh, injury above 30 days. You can change this by the kinds of sports you're playing and for males you probably have to do a lot of throwing between 11 and 16 to get this protective effect. Out of interest, if your sport involves forcing you to the other extreme, it turns out as you might expect that these arms, or at least of the people who end up at the highest levels of these sports, uh, display extreme ranges of motion in the other direction and part of that is because of the twist in the humerus here. So what are the clinical implications? We'll stop trying to understand it like this. This just confuses things. Just remember that this, for example, say is me. I've got a 25 degree difference in uh, humeral torsion. So with my glenohumeral joint in the same position, my arms are gonna be twisted apparently 25 degrees differently. So I should have 25 degrees more external on my throw M arm and 25 degrees less internal rotation range of motion. So if my range is like that, then that tells me that's what I've got to get back or like that, or like that, or importantly, if I've got too much rotational range, it can tell me in what direction I've got too much. Tendons, we know a lot more about tendons now, and we know uh, briefly that tendons don't really like being compressed. Uh, they don't like underloading or overloading. A relatively recent paper, but a whole series of those will show that a healthy tendon, the tenocytes look like this, and in tendinopathic, <coughs> we get more tenocytes and they start to become more rounded and appear much more like chondrocytes. The biomechanics of the loads that the tendon is placed under help to tell us why tendons get damaged where they do. So when you have a tendon that has wasting like this, so it gets narrower here, we're going to see relative compression within the tendon during dorsiflexion at that point.
Um, I haven't seen this described in the literature, but it's actually really easy to find. This is a supraspinatus tendon. We can see exactly the same neovessel changes in the supraspinatus. There's just a couple of technical tricks to getting the images like this, which relate to not putting your arm back in that position and not pushing quite so hard with the probe, but it's really easy to see. Uh, so that during ankle dorsiflexion, for example, we see that you can get a mechanical compression of the tendon against the adjacent uh, calcaneus, and that's why Kager's fat pad sits in here. Um, and during the Achilles tendon, for example, so we say that if it's being wasted and squashed, relative compression here, two to six centimetres proximal to its attachment, we're going to get that kind of compression, but we're also going to get it here against the adjacent calcaneus tendons like this kind of load. The anatomy though helps to explain to us why the supraspinatus tendon gets damaged and where it gets damaged. Uh, just a stripped out supraspinatus looks like that, but you'll always see two bellies in the supraspinatus. The tendon itself doesn't exhibit this wasting, but because of the relatively larger contractile element associated with the anterior aspect of the supraspinatus tendon, this is the bit that gets overloaded, but it gets overloaded largely in compression at its insertion. Now back to our throwers and to see the capsule infolding at arthroscopy you need to get them into this abducted and externally rotated position to be able to see the posterior superior cuff fold into the joint. So how does that relate to the relocation sign? Well our supposition when we do a relocation is I'm just pushing the head of the humerus posteriorly but in fact I'm not. In fact, I'm taking the humerus and the scapula posteriorly, so the net effect I'm getting is a change in the amount of horizontal adduction when I do a relocation sign. So when I do this sign, if the capsule is folding into the posterior superior recess, then when I do my relocation sign, I just take it out of the way, and that's the reason that the pain goes away. Quickly and almost finally, the glenoid labrum we used to think that the labrum was going to get pulled off with some degree of shoulder instability and that may well be the case in some category of patients but in throwers it's a completely different mechanism and the mechanism explains to us why we get labral injuries, long head of biceps injuries at the groove which are compressive tendinopathic injuries uh, as well as why the mechanism is going to result in posterior superior cuff tears. And the reason for that is that during, uh, and again, I'm grateful to Dr. Glenn Fleissig at the ASMI in Birmingham, Alabama. During abduction external rotation, the tension on the long head of biceps occasioned by rotation, and because the long head of biceps is relatively trapped in the bicipital groove, leads to an increase in tension here at the superior labrum, which is the insertion of the long head of the biceps. So during that external rotation and also internal rotation, that's how we're going to pull off the superior labrum. Think now though also about the compressive forces that are going through the long head of the biceps tendon inside the groove here. And these compressive forces will lead to biceps tendon changes. And now also think if this whole thing translated posterior superiorly, what's going to happen to heighten those forces? We're going to get more tension here, we're going to get more compression here, and we're going to beat up even more on the posterior superior cuff. So it's this rotation which pulls the uh, superior labrum and its associated long head of biceps backwards and forwards. Let's not get too carried away with that though. We've probably been fooled by this. This is the only paper I know which describes the innovation of the the labrum and this is the entire two sentences regarding the labrum, the labrum's innovation which is really rather poor. The last thing I want to talk about is one that I'm kind of vexed about because clinically pretty much the first thing I will look at with every patient is their scapular dyskinesia and we've talked a lot about how biomechanics are going to change loads on the labrum, the long head of biceps and the cuff and we've largely been talking about it in terms of the humerus moving. But the glenohumeral joint is half glenoid, and the glenoid is the scapula. So alterations and aberrations in scapular positioning absolutely must change what's going on at the glenohumeral joint. Just the thing is, we haven't proved it yet. Our diagnostic accuracy is really rather poor when it's held up to the light of a systematic review. While this is absolutely how I will work clinically, none of these links are yet proven. So when we look at um, case control for injured and uninjured, the best that we can do is go from, where is it, 24, this is in absence of tilting, so four extra subjects in 36, so you only get one in nine extra bits of accuracy. 
by describing the presence of scapular d dyskinesis with and without shoulder pain. Otherwise, it's a bust. If we look at it prospectively, uh, the presence or absence of scapular dyskinesia really doesn't tell us anything. If anything here, it's saying people with normal scapular positioning are more likely to get injury, and we know that that's wrong. And this is probably because we're just not terribly good at measuring it. This is, to my knowledge, the only study that's put K wires into the scapula and then shown what actually happens during movement and our attempts to palpate and find where the scapula is. So by putting this digital protractor on where different parts of the scapula were positioned and then accurately correlating that with, in fact, where the scapula was, it quantifies the error and the error is really quite large and it depends on the movement that you're doing. And that probably relates to the amount of variability. Only seven subjects volunteered for this study, as you might expect. But the between subject variability is massive in abduction in even something as simple as just reaching forward. What do we do when we change the scapular positioning? How does that, uh, what do we do when we intervene clinically to try and change scapular positioning? Well, to my knowledge, only three papers have looked at this. 100 seconds of stretching for six weeks resulted in no changes in asymptomatics with a bad scapular posture. 90 seconds of daily stretching for only two weeks resulted in a statistically significant but likely clinically meaningless and certainly not measurable difference in scapular positioning. And one paper has found that an intervention has shown both a statistical and likely clinically significant difference between the two. Clearly, we've got work to do here, but this is where I think there's a lot of fish to be caught. We measure this statically or under slow movements. How well does that correlate during high speed movements? We have no idea. When we look at this elsewhere in the body, we find that these static movements correlate very poorly with what people do during high speed movements. How well can we change these motor behaviours? We have no idea. We know we can change them in the clinic when people are moving slowly. How well does that translate to what they're doing on the pitch? We have no idea. So here's my summary and final thanks before I get off the stage, and those are the main points that I wanted to get across. Thanks very much.